shattered and grieved. See the devil wanna scatter and deceive. And God's no love, he'll leave you battered to bleed. Every day getting sadder, we need the love of Jesus Christ instead of another platter of weed. I pray the Lord has mercy on my soul. Sometimes I find me climbing up the ladder of greed. Trying to get my screw right, but the Lord said I was born in Mexico and my 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 family uh, came to the United States when I was one year old and we we grew up in LA. Part of Huntington Park and Boyle Heights, East LA area. We grew up in, in those cities around nothing but what we, we know what comes from those areas. The, the poverty, the, the violence. Um, I grew up with a stepdad who uh, raised me with ten brothers and sisters who was an alcoholic. He liked to drink a lot, he had a lot of a lot of problems with his drinking and, and abuse. So at home I already started experiencing a lot of that uh the anger, the, the bitterness towards uh, that kind of uh, environment. Um, my surrounding, <clears throat> there was a lot of gangs in my life, a lot, a lot of, a lot of uh, uncles that were involved in different different activity, activities like drugs or even uh, cousins that were involved in gangs. Um, now this is East LA, correct? <clears throat> right? Hunting Park, East LA area, all that, yeah. <clears throat> my uncle, most of my uncles were from uh, Watts in that area. That's where they grew up. But they had that gangster mentality. They were gang members, and they would always uh, try to brainwash you to think with with pride, to think um, respect. Give you you gotta earn your respect. So you're growing up in an environment where everybody is, has uh, that tough guy attitude. You can't be disrespected. You can't nobody disrespect you. But at home, uh, dealing with my, my dad and, and, the, and the verbal abuse and physical abuse. Um, that that would that would plant a lot of seeds in my heart of, of anger of hatred. He had good intentions sometimes, but I, I didn't know he was my stepdad until I was 17. So as a young kid, when my mom met him, uh, my mom was already pregnant from some from my real dad. But he ended up taking her, dating her, marrying her, and, and then when I was born, he took me in as a son, but I never knew he was my stepdad till I was 17. So through those years, I experienced a lot of, uh, I could feel I could feel the difference, the favoritism towards my brothers and sisters. He, I could feel the, the pushiness of the physical, verbal abuse, that I, I could feel the difference, because I know that they weren't getting it. So that started making me uh, like feel rejected. From that rejection, I started feeling a lot of anger too, and I couldn't stand uh, him just looking at me funny or disrespect me, talking to me funny, because I wanted to last shot and hit him, do something to him. So that started making me really hate uh, bullies. It started, I would say, from and when it started really boiling inside me, like at 10 years old, I started feeling this this real anger, anger that that was strong in me. By him, he was drinking, and he told me, "Hey, uh, I want to tell you something." And when he would get real drunk, he would try to stop, start talking to me about. Uh, he tried to get real uh, emotional, so he started talking about his, his little bit of his past and what he's been through. And he started telling me, "I need to tell you something. I need to tell you that, that uh, you're not my son, but I love you like my son." And I was like, "Being normal, my son, you're drunk. You know what you're talking about." And I would think he was just drunk and saying nonsense. But that day, my mom uh, was in the kitchen. She heard when he was talking to me about that, and she called me to the kitchen. She goes, what's your dad telling you? <clears throat> I go, Mom, he's drunk. And then I said, well, he's saying he's not my dad. And I'm 17 years old. I'm actually training during that time, trying to get into the Olympic team for 1988. And uh, so I'm not really trying to get involved in nothing, get distracted by anything. She's, she starts, but then she starts crying. She goes, what if I tell you that it's true? And she got tears in her eyes. And I'm like, you know what I want to hear right now? And I just ignored it. I just got bothered by it. I just walked away. So you just suppressed it? I suppressed it. I held it inside. Even though he was abusive in the way he was, I still had, I knew I still had this love for him, but I had this hatred for him too. I felt sorry for him too because I, I, I'd see him drink, drinking, I'd see him drunk. And, and, and to me, he was, he was a, that addiction had him, but I didn't understand the addiction. I didn't understand his life. So to me, that gave him a little more like, like, even though I want to beat him sometimes, the other side of me didn't want to beat him because I saw how weak he was because of addiction. Mm -hmm. So inside when he wasn't drunk, he was acting funny. Yeah, inside me, I wanted to hurt him, but 
I was raised Catholic, and in our belief system back then, that belief system with my parents' upbringing, their traditional upbringing, which is, we know that a lot of people don't study the Bible, so they a lot of times say stuff that's not biblical, so they would always use God to try to put fear in you, to try to control you with, with God. They would say, if you don't do this, God's gonna punish you, or if you disrespect your parents, God's gonna punish you. So me, in my mind, I'm trying to be respectful towards God, so I'm not trying to uh, beat up my dad, you know, or, or catch him when he's sleeping, when he's sleeping. There was all those thoughts would come to my head, but of course, I had the fear of God, this, this vicious, violent, vindictive God. We, we got along too, but at the same time, my mom was, was uh, she had a lot of her plate. She had, we had 10 brothers and sisters. We're, wow. We, had, we were brought up poor. My mom had to work and still collect welfare to raise us because my dad couldn't keep his job all the time because when he was getting drunk or he was injured, it was not like he was really fully dependent upon. And, and the money he made sometimes, it was more on, on his alcohol. So it was really my mom working working hard for, for whatever uh, whatever she could do but when it had to do with uh, being home with the mother's mother and, and doing the work out of the house sometimes. So it was one of those things where my older brother myself. <clears throat> now where were you, in the middle? Or? I was second oldest. Second oldest. <clears throat> so my, my so oldest, a lot of responsibility fell yeah. on you. So my oldest brother and myself would work with my uncles in construction. We're already little kids, but we, we'd help them for $20 a week just to get our own shoes, <clears throat> get our own clothes. Cause <clears throat> we didn't want to be, we didn't want to feel like we were out of, not like felt out of place because everybody would have the Nikes or with the Vans. We wanted to buy our own stuff too. <laughs> right. So we wanted, we either had to work, collect hands or, or whatever we could to, to make some money just to get our stuff. So you developed a, a, a good work ethic early. Now, was yeah, that in early. school also? In, in school, I like, I didn't really like school too much, but I could, when I when I like a subject, I get I can get down <clears throat> and study and, and ace it. But if I I didn't think that that subject was interesting to me, I wouldn't care for it. But I, for, I knew that I could ace the test. Uh, sports was my favorite. <laughs> PE yeah. was my favorite. Right, right. English was my so favorite. You always athletic. I was always I've been athletic. That's what got me. It built my confidence as even though I know <clears throat> we, we don't have to boast in our gifts, we gotta glorify the Lord. When you don't know any better, <clears throat> I use my gifts, my, my talents in sports to build an image for myself. To build this image so that people can respect me out there and, and look up to me in, in a way where um, they knew in, in that mentality I was somebody. You know, because when you're athletic and people look up to you <clears throat> and you don't get the accolades at home, you don't get the attention at home, you don't get the love at home, you're looking for that love somewhere else. You might be looking for it with your girls, with the girls in school, your friends to accept you. You want to be the man. Now, did your stepdad ever show up any of your sporting events? <clears throat> never. Never show up to any of my, my sporting events. And, and what did that do to you? I just got used to it. I was on my. I felt like I was on my own, so it was a goal that I wanted. But but initially, you know. Oh, messing with your head because you see other people having their parents go to their sports, uh, their activity, and they support them. And sometimes when you don't have that support at home, yeah, it's gonna affect you. But if you have a goal in mind, and like in my mind, I wanted to, boxing was my number one, my, my number one love back then. Boxing. I love boxing because it gave me discipline, taught me how to fight. It, it, it helped me learn to respect myself, respect others too at the same time, but also <clears throat> it built this, of course we say confidence in, in a negative way because you know you could do something and <clears throat> not everybody can do it even though we know that people carry guns and, and everything else out there, but uh, I used to like to be the one with the, I used to use that take the, what they call the uh, killer with a smile, you, you, you're smiling, you're friendly, but they don't realize that <clears throat> they, they get you on the wrong side, <clears throat> you're gonna get them. uncles that were from neighborhoods in, in Watts, they were gang members from Watts, and, and some of them, that they were old, way older than me, so they were like, in the my role models, and uh, they would always try to instill some, some of their street belief system, when they would say, look, I was a kid, I remember being five, six, seven years old, and they already started brainwashing me with the mentality of, of not, not ever backing down, not ever letting nobody disrespect you, they still this, this evil pride inside me that <clears throat> made me believe that I could not back out of a fight. No matter who disrespect me or bully me or punk me or, or, or tried to, I had to stand up to myself and beat them. I so they were training you at a young kid how to fight. Kid. How, like five years old, six years six, old? Six, seven years old, teaching me how to do kicks, 
but then they throw me in the in, when they when I go to TJ to Mexico, they, they have pig pig pens <clears throat> and they'll have me fight with my other uncles that were my age or older, and they have a wrestling fight in there and just wrestling fight and until somebody tapped. We we're little kids. And they enjoy watching doing that, and, and I couldn't back out of that because to me it was like I have to let them know I'm not afraid. When instead of me, if I was known better, now I would have been a little sm- slicker than that. I would say, "Why don't you guys do it?" But I was their entertainment. So in my mind, I'm thinking I'm impressing these guys. That makes me tough. That makes me a man. Whatever, whatever the case may be, because your your mind tells you stuff because you don't know any better. So that attention, and then you like the attention because you like the accolades. You like the the. Good work, good good job. You you get the 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 what you said uh, affirmation. Start affirming. Start making you feel like you you did something good. You impressed them. Whatever <clears throat> you're, they accept you. So because at home <clears throat> you get a lot of negative um, feedback from your parents. Like <clears throat> my dad would always cuss me out. <clears throat> Excuse me, he'll, he'll cuss me out. He call me negative negative words. Uh, that made me f- <clears throat> feel really bad, really mad, and hateful. Even if it wasn't true what he said about me, <clears throat> I didn't know any better. It, built, <clears throat> it actually built pride and even like a form of uh, fear that if I don't stand up, if I don't do something, people are going to think I'm scared. In reality, <clears throat> it's not about being scared. <clears throat> it's really about being wise and learning how to walk away, but I was never taught that going on. So growing up as a kid in, in junior elementary, junior high, high school, <clears throat> anybody tried to <clears throat> disrespect me, if it was one guy, two, three guys, I would stand up for myself and I end up getting into a fight. In junior high, into fighting two, three guys sometimes, even if they jumped me and beat me up, I wouldn't back out and my friends could watch the rage come out of me. The rage that was so destructive because I would start cussing and saying some stuff like, I want to kill you, man. And I would mm-hmm. say some evil, na- nasty stuff that it would scare my friends. And they wouldn't even want to jump in to help me. I, I never liked the, the gang uh, structure mentality because I didn't. I, I felt growing up as a kid, I, I, I thought that growing up around gangs and, and they, I felt that teaming up and, and, and being, feeling, feeling confident that you have a bunch of your homeboys to help you. I didn't believe in that stuff. I thought that was being more of like afraid to be your own man and fight for yourself for yourself. So in my mind, I didn't want to be part of that. I, I said, I don't, I don't believe in that stuff. I don't want to be part of that. I didn't want to be part of a structure where somebody's telling me how to be, how to live. So I was trying to be my own person. But how did the gangs respond to that? I mean, the, the Lone Ranger. <clears throat> they left me alone because, because uh. Because your uncles? No, because, because I didn't bother nobody. I wouldn't bother nobody. But at the same time, um, as a kid, I know that it, it's bad. But growing up in that environment, when I was boxing, like at the age of 15, I'm already, I'm already going for my first Golden Gloves. To get up in the morning to go jogging in that environment, I'd have to have a little 25 pistol on me. And I put it in my sleeve and I'm jogging by myself at 15 years old. I'm getting ready for the for the fighting. So I'm not trying to get shot, I'm not trying to get robbed or, or mugged or beat up by some weirdo out there. So in my mind, I, I was already like some survival mode kicked in. Were these the uncles that gave you this guy? I, I got to be somebody. I don't remember if it was yeah. my uncle, but I would always come up with. It was, I knew a lot of neighborhoods. I knew for, for the neighborhoods out there with Florencia. I boxed in the, in the projects where Big Hazard was at. I boxed around a lot of the, the old old gang members, and they liked me because uh, I was a young Mexican kid coming up in, in the boxing world. So they, they respected me, they liked me, but at the same time, I knew I had access to stuff I needed it. So you became almost like a neighborhood celebrity? <clears throat> Probably, yeah, with some of my friends, yes. <laughs> Uh, my, my coach, Al Stanky, he he ran the Hollenbeck Youth Center back then. He was actually a good coach. He was also a retired LAPD. He took nine, he took Paul Gonzalez to 1984 Olympics. Paul Gonzalez won the, the gold medal. He was from East LA. He won the first the gold medal in 1984 Olympics when they were in LA. And Paul Gonzalez was also my he's a good friend of mine, but we sparred a lot too. And and Al Stanky, because of the, the background ex- the experience he has in Olympic uh, fighters, Somehow he ended up taking Oscar from his coaches, or they they brought him to him, and he started training him. Well, then Oscar and I started becoming sparring partners. But we had already been sparring partners when he was with the other team, with the other coaches, because I knew his coaches, and we we're both. He was probably like uh, I was 125, he's 132, but we spar a lot because we were both coming up, and, and he he was taller than me, he was heavier than me, but we had some good sparring matches, some solid good sparring matches. I mean, so you got to be pretty good to. 
be a sparring partner. You have to be. Yeah, you have to be. Because they're not going to, they don't want he don't want a punching bag in there. He don't want somebody he's going to just slap around and not get nothing out of him. He wants somebody that's going to help him too. Challenge. Sharpen his, his skills. So he's going to challenge him. So, of course, <clears throat> they're going to go to the sparring partners that challenge him, that push him. And it's like he pushed me, I push him, and we sharpen each other up. And, and the ring is a different story when you're in that ring. I mean, you could be buddies outside and say what's up, but when you're in that ring, it's, it's, a, different, it's a chess game, but there's a, a bloody chess game. Right. Because you're going to hurt, you, you want to hurt him, he wants to hurt you. You want to out slick, he wants to out slick you. Right. So you excel in boxing, you become <laughs> Golden Gloves. I got, I got, the, I fought the Golden Gloves in 1985, 86, Diamond Belt Tournament. <clears throat> I started getting up there to the point where I wanted to <clears throat> prep, prepare myself for the 1988 Olympics. But during the big tournament that I was supposed to fight in 87, uh, Johnny Flores, I was walking up to the ring to meet my opponent and they they stopped me a middle middle road to get to the ring to tell me that I couldn't fight that tournament because I hadn't got my citizenship yet. Because mm. I was born in Mexico. So they threw me off, the, basically threw me off the team. In 1986, they allowed me to fight as a U.S. citizen against the Mexican Olympic team, representing the United States. But now in 87, because it's close to the Olympic stuff, they threw me off the team, they let me fight. So I get a little disappointed, mad, but I, I start working on my paperwork. I get my citizenship, but it's too late for the 88. So I start getting myself ready for the 92 Olympics. So the process, I'm, I'm, everything's going good. I'm, I'm competing and winning tournaments. Before the 90, maybe like 91 or so, I end up getting hurt and injured. I get sick, ear and throat infection, fever. It, it, it stopped me from getting to the tournament that would have got me to the trials. And from there, I left it alone because I knew that I wanted the gold medal. To me, the gold medal is more important to me just to immediately turn pro and, and work my way up as a pro and go through the sharks because there's so much corruption in, in boxing too. <clears throat> Politics is bad. I didn't want to have to uh, work my way up there and bleed too much just to get that that opportunity to get a title belt and then end up punchy, end up messed up in your head because of all the boxing. So my next goal is to become a police officer for LAPD. Now how did that come about? <clears throat> I grew up in an environment where I saw cousins, friends, uncles get killed from gangs or drugs. I had an uncle when I was like 10, 11 years old who was like my favorite uncle. Um, he got killed because he was a drug, drug dealer from, from TJ. He'd bring the drugs and uh, he ended up uh, <clears throat> getting set up by somebody for two kilos of cocaine in the 19, like 81, 82. They set him up. He was going to deliver two keys of cocaine to somebody at a bar. <clears throat> they set him up and killed him and robbed him. Mm. I was a little kid. And what did that do to you? That affected me bad. It made me hate drug dealers. It made me hate them too. To, to, to so is robbed. that one of the reasons that kind of swayed you away from the gangs? And that and because I had uncles and cousins get killed in gangs too. Now how did they feel friends. about you going into law enforcement? Everybody was happy and, and, and I guess proud of me because I was succeeding. I was doing something positive. I was actually meeting my, accomplishing my goals. And I was uh, focused. I was determined. I wanted to do something positive. I wanted to help people. I did. I never. I mean, I always enjoyed helping people, helping others. I felt it was a good thing. It was nat It was natural to me. I enjoyed doing that. So there I am, applying for the department. Al Stanky was a retired police officer. So being that he was a retired police officer, I learned from him that he was actually a good coach. And he mentored a lot of the kids in the in inner cities in East LA because that's where I trained in, in Boyle Heights. He would get us as young kids, and he would take care of us. He was a, he respected us. He took care of us. He showed that he cared about us. Of course, he cared about our skills too. Because if you're a good boxer, he's gonna he's gonna take care of you even more. <laughs> but I still enjoy the fact that this person was there. And he uh, took the time to take us to our fights, uh, take us training, running, you name it. He was there for us. So to me. He being a good uh, ex-cop or a cop, he had uh, a lot of influence over us, and we respected him. <clears throat> so in my mind, I'm thinking, me, <clears throat> I could become a police officer. <clears throat> I could give, go back in the neighborhoods I grew up in <clears throat> and, and give back, help these youngsters, so they don't take that 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 left right turn to go into a neighborhood or join a gang or, or get into the dope game and get themselves caught up and get themselves killed or or put in prison. Yeah, in the community, I, I, I grew up in the Hollenbeck Youth Center boxing training and, and it's in East LA and the youth center would start giving you PR, they start pimping you out, well basically exposing you as, as an Olympic hopeful. 
So right. I was being exposed as an Olympic hopeful during right. that time. Right. So I was able to rub shoulders with certain celebrities too. Like I even did bodyguard for for Arnold Schwarzenegger during during those times. Really? We had wow. this thing called 19. It was the uh, Inner City Games at the Hollenbeck Youth Center. Danny Hernandez is the director there, and I boxed there. I, I worked there, and they also, I also had a job with them there. So. Uh, and I worked for private investigators during that time. So my bosses at the private investigators, they were retired at LAPD. When they were doing the inner city games, they, Arnold Schwarzenegger was uh, basically the commissioner of this inner city game back in 19, I don't remember if it was 1991. Mm -hmm. But during that time, when it first started, <clears throat> they brought in celebrities to, to, to show up to the function and show support because the money is being raised. It's like a mini Olympics for, for the inner cities, gotcha. all the projects. And they, they have they have venues, they have a, Boxing, soccer, baseball, just like a mini Olympic type thing for, for the kids in inner cities. Hmm. And it was created by the, by some of the guys and people in the youth centers. I think it's, it was, uh, Holyfield was in Atlanta, Georgia. And Arnold was the commissioner out here in, in East LA, in California. But uh, I was given an opportunity to do bodyguarding work for him and for some other celebrities like Muhammad Ali and different people. It's, uh, I first have to apply, and take the written exam, you pass that, and then you go to the, to the uh, psychological back, you got a background check, psychological test, physical test. Once you pass that whole thing, they, they call you and tell you that you are selected, you're gonna be in the academy class. 1993, I got selected, and they, they sent me to the academy, 1993. So I'm in the academy, it's a seven month academy. <clears throat> they got tactics training, human relations, uh, different report writing, law training. So you, you have to excel in all that stuff in order for you to pass. It's like going to college. It's like going to college, yeah. It's a crash course college because it's, it's police work and, and they train you in, in shooting and every little scenario that's going out there. So you're still in the process. You still have to take a lot of tests and you have to rank pretty. I mean, you have to pass basically. And if you want to shine, you want to outrank others, you have to. If it's in you, it's gonna be in you. That's that's if that's your nature to always excel, you're gonna excel. And I, I did good in the academy. I worked my butt off, and you know I, I got through it. I got I got hired. I mean, I basically got when I got out of there. They said I wanted to go to South Central to work patrol, and I went to South Central for like six months. While there, they recruited me to work in the undercover high school program. That's when they sent me to work. It's like under undercovers, uh, like 21 Jump Street. Right. They sent me back to high school, and they let, I, I'm in 11th grade. I'm, I'm already 23 years old. They sent me back as an 11th grader. I gotta fit in. I gotta blend in. I gotta play the part. Because what they want you to do is infiltrate and find out where these kids are getting the drugs from, who's supplying them, and uh, basically to try to lead, lead lead you to the to the big suppliers. So I'm in this high school and, and I'm, I'm buying drugs and <clears throat> getting intel. And at one point, I'm supposed to buy some PCP from someone, one of the kids. He uh, sets up a, a night to sell me the drugs. So I'm supposed to get a page from him. A night late, a day later, I get a phone call for a page from him because we had pages back then. It's 1994. He pages me, tells me that he's gonna meet me uh, the next day, eighty dollars a, a container of PCP, a, a vial. I forget how much it was. A, when I'm on the phone, um, these two older gang members try to rob me, and uh, I get into a shootout with them. I end up getting shot in both of my legs, I end up shooting the guy, it, it becomes a big shooting. Praise God, I make it through that, and, and the department, um, where the department doesn't, uh, fails to, to realize that those type of shootings really impact a person. I got to the shootout and, and mentally, emotionally, so I was messed up. And that's what they call with post traumatic post -traumatic stress. stress disorder. <clears throat> I, I had post traumatic. And that wasn't really big as back then. Back in the nineties, nobody even talked about it. I don't even think they had a name for it. So <clears throat> I didn't know what it was. I didn't even know what was going on in my head. I just knew <clears throat> that I was different. So like, what does that do to your psyche? <clears throat> well, it, it depends how you respond to it. To me, <clears throat> it caused me to be more alert, more violent. More uh, paranoid. More paranoid. You you want you expect you think you're going to get to another shootout. You think everybody's got a gun. You think everybody's out there looking to <clears throat> to either rob you or, or shoot shoot it out with you. It just messes with your head. You have nightmares. You have uh, flashbacks. Um, 
<clears throat> it does mess with you. You don't have this peace, you don't rest. You're thinking all the time how to be aware, how to be ready for the next one. Now, how not to get caught slipping. And it's bad. No, no peace. No peace. First, it, it starts from, from childhood. It starts with whatever you're going through as a kid, whatever you've seen or experienced. My uncle getting killed, right. the abuse, your friends, people, cousins, uncles getting killed in, in, in drugs and gangs, and you hold on to all that. Uh, guns pointed in your head by gang members. Because it's all accumulated. It's accumulated because they want to rob you. Uh, neglect, rejection at home. <clears throat> Everything starts piling up on the inside. And if you don't know that there's a way to be released from that, be freed from that, you have cracks in your soul, you're beat up inside, and you open doors to other other bad behavior, other bad things, but then you also open doors to the spiritual part of, of the stuff that you don't, people don't understand. <clears throat> if you're practicing the sin, because we know that we were born in sin, and there's certain sins, uh, sin is sin, but if you get so caught up in practicing certain sins, you open the door, and you don't realize that behind the scenes, if there is a spiritual world we, we don't we don't know, people don't know fully know that it exists, but it does exist, <clears throat> you open doors to demonization. And sometimes, the strongholds can influence that behavior, that habit. If it's a if it's an addiction, if it's lust, if it's anger, rage, violence, murder, uh, <clears throat> you, you name it, you open that door, and now you're influenced. You're being influenced by some some demonic entity, <clears throat> spirit, who's going to be influencing that behavior. Now, are you self medicating <clears throat> at this time? No. Well, my self medication back then, which to me was alcohol and, and weed. Right. And that was my self medication Because... And what did that do? It, it would help, help me relax. If I smoked some, some, some weed or drank some alcohol, <clears throat> once I was done with my day, it would relax my mind to stop thinking about all that stuff. And it, it would slow my mind down. Like to a point where all those crazy thoughts would, would calm down. Now it comes <clears throat> a point where you start having some financial issues. We'll come to a point where uh, I'm actually... Um, I started uh, dealing with, I was paying child support $1,500 a month, but at the same time, um, actually I started, I got surgery on my shoulder. And from having good, a lot of good jobs on the side, besides my police job, I was having other jobs. Uh, the, the department, uh, because of workers' comp, they take all my other jobs away for they tell me I can't do these jobs because workers' comp is pay my bills. So now I'm having to depend on workers' comp. And in my mind, I'm not, I don't like that because I'm thinking I'm not to depend on them. So I started, well, the whole process in the department, a lot of stuff accumulated and a lot of stuff happened in the police department. <clears throat> I started holding on to a lot of resentment towards the police department, towards management, towards just people overall, everything I saw. And it just it accumulated from the first shooting to my second shooting, from the, from the violence, started happening when I I wasn't looking for it it's like I started one of my partners got killed a guy that I worked around got killed a year later got killed um, I started thinking about how the department treats the family I'm starting thinking now I'm, I'm, I'm justifying everything because I'm saying you know what this department sucks this department here they don't know what it's like to be on on that field dealing with all the gangs all the violence and then you have your partners get killed, you get killed, who's gonna take care of your family? They're not. So on my mom, I'm already excuse myself, I said, I'm not gonna put my family through this. Right. I said, because these gang members are making about a million dollars a month or so with extortions, with the dope that they're bringing in. I said, man, you're making more money than me. And on my mind, I'm getting, because I'm, I'm getting a little angry, but you know, I'm bitter. saying to myself, here I am putting my, my life on the line, working my, my butt off all these years. And I'm still struggling right, right here because, and I have this job. I'm still struggling because of this, because of that. Not realizing that sometimes we don't know, but right. when, we, when we look at the Bible now, we have a, we, we have a, a curse, financial curse. We can have certain curses. We don't realize that's what's going on in our life. We don't know that the reason we're having all these little troubles is, is spiritual. Mm -hmm. spiritual. We don't see that part. Right. <laughs> well, back then I didn't know that stuff, but I'm looking at the physical stuff, the thinking by having money, it's gonna fix my problems at home. It's gonna fix my problems, but it's not. But I'm assuming that, so <clears throat> in my mind, I, I, a seed was planted in my head. <clears throat> I said, I'm gonna start jacking these things. I'm gonna start going out there, uh, getting some connections. <clears throat> Cause I already started establishing a uh, connection with some of the drug dealers out there. So immediately I started talking to some people and said, hey look, 
this is what I want to do, but keep it to yourself. <clears throat> if you have a debt, you want me to collect a, a dope debt, but it's got to be in the mails up, so I don't... I'll now, how would you gain their trust? Because they're looking at you like, <clears throat> one of the is guys, this guy setting me up? One of the guys I spoke to first, I grew up with him. And I knew he was connected already. I knew he had been, he had the time in the state for, for, uh... He, they they, they can't have to do that old money for some of the dope dealers, and they had him there <clears throat> uh, collecting the debt for me. So, but I knew he was doing that before, and he had, he had gotten out, and I, I knew he was still doing stuff. So, he knew since we were kids, but they all knew that <clears throat> here I am on top. And so, I'm, I'm hitting him up, and I told him I'm serious. I said, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I said, You gotta, <clears throat> I said, You gotta keep it to yourself because you're gonna remember this is not a little game stuff, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this, but <clears throat> if I'm gonna do something. I, I'm aware of what could happen, and I'm serious about it too. But we gotta look out for each other. So he said, "I'll look into it." So he was freaking out at first. So first, you gained their gain their trust. trust. So it took yeah. a, it took a minute to gain their trust. Yeah, I gained his trust. <clears throat> Once I did gain his trust, <clears throat> it was easier because then he started uh, reaching out to his connections, and they ended up putting putting the, the first job, for me, the first job. And then once we, we hit the first house, I was actually, I had to talk to one of my, a couple of my partners, they were cops, I had to convince them that, it, that we're gonna go collect the debt. And, and it was illegal, of course, but we wouldn't do it because I thought these guys weren't victims. Said, so they had financial problems too, a lot of these well, one, Yeah, some of them did, yeah. And they were having divorce, marital problems, they were having problems at home. So it just, you gotta remember the, the department, the department that's supposed to serve the public, they have a lot more problems than the public they're serving. But they, there's no, they don't understand where the outlets are. They don't know where to go for help. So a lot of them have post-traumatic stress too. They say 85% of them have post-traumatic stress disorder. Also, um, and substance high abuse, divorce, substance, substance, substance abuse, abuse issue. alcohol abuse, divorce is high, domestic violence is high. There's so many things that go on in the apartments, and we don't realize that it has to do with our, our lifestyles too, or our choices. So this money, in essence, was helping maybe to support their habit that they right. had obtained yeah. Even if they're gambling. through, you know, so self-medicating through post-traumatic stress, Some form of escape. depression, they're, things of that sort. They're, they're finding, that was their escape. Okay, gotcha. And they're feeding their, their whatever their need was, their, okay. their, their fix. So you're doing this and, and you pull off maybe about what, about 30, 40? At least. Of, the, of these robberies. Yeah. No, this cop that got busted, he was already, uh, in, when I was in the gang unit, this guy, uh, the, I think the cop you're talking about, Rafael Perez, he got busted. Uh, he was, he had stole the drugs from the evidence room, had some people sell it for him. He got busted, he exposed and, and brought up our, exposed our gang unit. To get less time. To get less time. He talked about our gang unit and said, oh, you gotta look at, you gotta look at Palomar's, you gotta look at these guys. So he starts uh, bringing stuff up. Well, I'm not, they're looking at me, but they're looking at certain things in my case and, and, my, and my job related stuff. They have no clue that I'm doing this other stuff. I get set up because my cousin and his friend are dealing with some Colombians, supposedly Colombians in, in San Diego, and they're gonna go buy 10 kids cocaine off these guys. One of the guys asked if I could, he could borrow 100 grand from him because he wants to buy the 10 kids, and I end up lending him the money, but also he ends up in convincing me that this guy wants to hire me to collect the debt for him. So there I go like a, like a dummy to go meet the Colombian connection. I'm supposed to go meet him just because he wants to hire me to go collect the debt. While I'm there talking to him, I'm, we're about to leave from the, from the parking structure where we're at in, the, in uh, Chula Vista. It's a sting operation. They take us down right there for the 10 kids of cocaine. So here you are, a cop, form for cop, <clears throat> heading to prison. Heading to prison. A lot of bitterness, a lot of anger. I hate Still you. dealing with the post-traumatic stress. I, I mean, it's you. overwhelming. Yeah, I, I I can't even imagine how you're feeling at this time. It's one thing going to prison just in general. It's another thing going to prison, being a former cop. Yeah, and my mentality was uh, I got busted. I'm, I'm I'm ready to go go hard. And in my head, I'm all thinking, first guy that gets funny, I'm gonna bust him up. So I, you're gonna unleash your anger. If I have to break his neck, if I could break, if I'm gonna kill, I'm, I was in my head, I'm gonna kill, the, I was saying like that, I'm gonna kill. Him. And so then, you're looking for an opportunity almost to, yeah, to unleash your I'm, anger, I'm like prison is almost gonna be that outlet for you. Yeah, I'm thinking the first person that gets funny with me, I'm gonna kill him and then I'm gonna justify myself. So I'm gonna 
dirty cop, I should say. I'll fabricate, I'll justify it. And then I thought in my head, I'll get out of it. And then they're gonna leave me alone. Now, how many years do they initially give you? They sent me to 18 years. I did 16 out of 18. Okay, 16 out of 18. Now, when the beginning I had no, I, didn't, I was aware of the street politics and the gang parts because I was a gang cop, but I didn't know the fullness of the prison politics, how they had the structure. I didn't know enough of it. I was pretty ignorant to some stuff, so I wasn't aware of it because I'm, I'm from Mexico. And if me showing up to a prison, I have to run Baisa. But if I was from, if I'm a Southern California resident and maybe even Southern California gang member, I'd run Sureño. <clears throat> but um, when, when I first showed up to prison, the first few, three months, I was in the hole. I was in the hole by, my, by myself in the in the single cell. And the SIS lieutenant for the, for the feds didn't want to leave me in general population because of my background. But I told him, I ain't got no worries with nobody. I ain't got no beef with nobody. He goes, I don't care. I don't want problems. I don't want you to go out there and get in trouble, do something, or somebody try to do something, and then we're going to have problems. I said, well, it ain't going to happen. <clears throat> but through the process in my head, uh, I'm still thinking, wild. I'm like, I have a lot of bad thoughts in my head. I'm still thinking, I'm, you know, I'm going to get even. All these guys uh, betrayed me, told on me. I'm, I'm just getting, I'm getting some bad thoughts in my head while I'm in the hole. Well, Well, all of a sudden, I get this Hell's Angel, uh, ex Hell's Angel, to become my cellmate. He's a Christian now. I start sharing things with him, and he were talking, and he starts telling me that I told him that I uh, was ready to go to hell. And I told him, I said, "What's the point of being good? ready to go to hell? Hold on, like, why would you be ready to go to hell? What was, what's because I'm thinking I, I, I never heard of salvation. I never heard of the gospel. Nobody ever preached the gospel to me. <clears throat> Nobody ever preached the gospel to me. So I'm thinking, I already did all this crazy stuff. Uh, there's no way to turn back. There's no way to change your ways. No way to get a second chance. No way to to uh, start over. In my head, I'm thinking uh, the only way to go is with a bang. <clears throat> so I'm thinking in my head that <clears throat> what's the point of being good if there's no, no reward? There's nothing there for me. Now, at that time I had no clue, no idea the spiritual world was real because <clears throat> I, I didn't believe in a lot of the stuff that people talked about. <clears throat> I didn't believe in like the demon stuff. I, I didn't, <clears throat> I fully didn't understand it. It wasn't even part of your life. It wasn't <clears throat> part of any <clears throat> part of your culture. <clears throat> it wasn't, but it was because the people that worked for me, some of right. the guys that worked for me, would go to witches all the time. And they tell me, hey, come to my way. She's going to read you. Now, this is part of some of the guys within the gangs, within the, the cartels. cartels. Yeah. So the, you told me that they would put curses. They would get witches. They put, put curses on, on other, cartels. other cartels. Explain how that would work. Well, what happened first, um, let's just say you have a, a, a cartel guy that has beef with somebody else. Or even a girlfriend or a girlfriend with a guy. They'll go to witch. Sometimes they'll even try to get a picture from them or get some, some hair from them and give it to the witch. The witch will do their little rituals, whatever the whatever the process is, and they'll put a curse on the person. They could put a curse for death, they could put a curse for different reasons to be sprung attached to this person. It is a some way off the wall stuff, but it actually really is real. Well tell me. I was working, I was I was still uh, robbing his connections, I was taking down the, the cartel connections. They were, oh, they were, I was actually taking down the competition for them and uh, collecting debts for some of these guys. One of the guys that worked for me, when I was going to a witch, <clears throat> and he always invited me. I said, no. A lady witch? A, a lady witch, yeah. He'd be, come on, man, let's go to my witch, because uh, the last time we were going to go do a house, we'd take a, take a house down, he wouldn't go with me. I said, why not? My, my, I went to my witch, he said, not for me not to go, but you guys are good. I said, you believe all that stuff? I said, you're, you're crazy, man. Don't waste your time on that. I didn't believe him. <clears throat> so, just, to, just so you can leave me alone, so you can stop bugging me, I said, I'm going to go with you. Let's go. So I went to this witch over there in, uh, in LA, East LA area. So when we show up, I go first. So, so she has a room. She, I sit out in front of her. She has a table. She pulls out her cards, and then she reads my palm. And then she tells me, um, somebody cursed you. Somebody put a death curse on you. What does that mean? She says, they got, they got sand or dirt from the cemetery, put in a container, and did this whole thing on you. 
and they put a bad curse on you. I said, okay, I'm just listening to her. And then she says, also, I see you, you're going to get a surgery and it's not going to come out right. I never, I had no clothes going to get surgery. I, I had no intentions and no, none of that was in my mind at that time or in my plans. <clears throat> then she says, uh, um, I also see you in jail, in prison. Mm. And I, I'm like, yeah, whatever. She goes, I could help you. She says, um, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I basically play the part, but I never listened to her. I never did anything she See, did. are you thinking she's extorting you for money? I'm uh, just for not fear? believing her. Right. I'm not, I'm not thinking none of that. I'm just thinking she's, this is all fake. So I didn't follow up with nothing. Thank God that I didn't because now that I know the spiritual world and how it exists and how it operates, <clears throat> thank God for the Bible, for the Word of God. Um, had I allowed her to help me more, I would have got myself into another more curses because she's working with demonic powers. Now, some of this stuff came to pass. <clears throat> well, let me tell you. Yeah, what happened was, <clears throat> in the process of time, I'm working for the police department. I'm an instructor for the Department of Tactics and Self Defense. I end up getting injured on my shoulders. The department uh, sent me to a doctor, and that doctor is like a city doctor. So then from there, I'm supposed to go to a private doctor. I go to the private doctor, they find that I have uh, rotary cuff tears. So they're going to do my surgery. That I'm assuming this doctor's a uh, private doctor. Well, he's from a big hospital. Um, there, He also works for the city. Not unbeknownst to me, he's supposed to go in there and do arthroscopic surgery on my shoulder, but he doesn't. He goes in there. When I, they put me under for five hours, uh, they open my shoulder up from the top of my shoulder to the bottom to the armpit. They open me up and did a messed up surgery. That surgery came out bad. My shoulder is locked to this point. <clears throat> it's still locked. The range of motion is still restricted. There's now that they got to fix it now. But this happened back in 2000. That surgery came out bad. I didn't think about that witch. I never thought about the witch. The surgery came out bad. I had so to get when you're in prison, you have time to reflect back on all this. Well, <clears throat> they gave me a second surgery before I went to prison, um, and it's still not the same thing yet. So I was supposed to get surgery on my right shoulder. Well, through the process, of course, I get in trouble. I get arrested for, for what I'm doing. <clears throat> While I'm in prison, I'm still not aware of why I'm not paying attention to this. I don't even remember what this witch said because I'm not, I still didn't believe on this stuff. So now, <clears throat> when I'm in the hole with this Hell's Angel guy, he's already Christian. He tells me that I can get out of hell. I don't have to go to hell. He says, you can get a second chance. You can get your life right and you can get your salvation. And he starts preaching the gospel to me. <clears throat> and I'm praiseful grateful to God that he opened my heart up because because how long did it take it took you know what it just took the, I don't, it took it, it took like just the, the hearing the word of God hearing that that word of hope that that faith came inside my heart faith. now initially <clears throat> were you receptive or were you kind of I listened I listened because I wanted to know if it was real if it was true I had never heard it and to me I was lost I was already so lost and so so messed up and angry bitter to the point where I, th I think I thought my only way out was just to go out with a bang. And in my mind, I'm thinking when I walk out of this place, I'm going to go out and get, get get even. Who cares if they take me out? I'm still going down anyways. Might as well take whoever I can with me. In my head, I was so messed up with PTSD <clears throat> that I felt that was the way to go. I, just, I had no clue what was up ahead. I thought, man, everything's good. I'm safe. I'm right with God. Well, next thing you know, they get me out of general popul out of the hole, and they put me in general population. So now I'm, I'm open to the general population. And How are you feeling at that time? I'm excited about God. I don't even think about nothing. I'm just ready to go serve God in, in, in prison. Thinking, man, so no fear no about fear, nothing, nothing. I'm not even thinking about the politics. Nothing. When I show up to the to the general population, <clears throat> I'm, I'm there, and the the first day is good. The second day. <clears throat> I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm meeting, I met two other Christians in there, we're reading the Bible together, we're sharing the Lord, and I'm just thinking about Jesus, you know, about what he's doing. Now, are you, are you interacting with all different nationalities? Yeah, I am. Then, then all of a sudden, I get, I, I get confronted by the, the Southerners from there, the, the, the shot callers from, from the Southern gang there, they, they tell me I gotta leave because I'm the next cop. And I'm like, I said, prove it. I said, I ain't going nowhere. So all of a sudden, the, 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 the violent, violent uh, defense of uh, angry mentality kicks into me. Like, these, these punks ain't gonna tell me what to do. And I said, I'm not going nowhere, man. I said, I, I, I'm not going by myself. We're all gonna go together. And I told my Chris, now I'm trying, I'm, getting, I'm trying to get my life right. I'm trying to change. I said, I don't want no problems. I told him that, right? <clears throat> so then, 
told her, this is how, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna give God all the glory because I believe this is all perfectly perfected by God because when I'm there, the shot caller was from the neighborhood that I grew up around. And his shot caller, his boss from the street, was my friend I used to train him in boxing. So I tell him, hey, do, do me a favor, call Chief. You know Chief, oh yeah, that's my homie. I go, well, call him up. So when he calls him, I guess Chief basically cleaned me up and they left me alone. I was able to stay there two years, general population, preaching and learning, studying, I started getting deep into the word. Well, that's when the real deep spiritual warfare starts, the, uh, things start happening. When, one day, I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, it's like a year only, it's been like a year. I'm still talking to my, uh, my ex, who had my daughters, and I get into a big old argument with her on the phone. And I want to cuss, and I want to lash out, and I'm thinking, whoa, where'd that come from? I thought I was a Christian. I thought I was, I was supposed to be all holy and good. I didn't know that that stuff happens, you know? <laughs> so I started talking to God about it. I said, Lord, I don't understand this. Why do I have this anger and rage inside me that makes me want to hurt people still? I feel, I feel ugly. And the thing about it is, I don't understand how could a Christian be that way or act like that? Aren't, aren't Christians supposed to be these these holy, perfect individuals. In my mind, I'm thinking, once you give your life to Christ and you read the Bible, everything's supposed to be good and you're good to go and you're changed. There's nothing going, going to happen. You're not going to do nothing crazy no more. And you're going to be good. I didn't, I wasn't aware of what's going, what's going to happen to me next. The spiritual warfare starts. Now, I ask God to help me, show me what was wrong with me, why I have these issues. So the when first thing- spiritual warfare, describe it. Describe uh, that to our viewers. Um, the Bible says, clearly states that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities, power, rules, of the world, spiritual hosts of weakness in heavenly places. It's a structured army, a spiritual army that it does exist. You don't see it. <clears throat> you might not see it physically because they're going to keep themselves in, 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 the, uh, in the dark. So you don't see them. You don't know they exist. So you don't. So you don't prepare yourself for them, learn how to how to overcome against them. But when you look around, just but what you see, the evil that you see, the violence, all the different stuff that's going on in this world, um, there's some demonic and spiritual influence behind it too. On the good and the bad side, there is no uh, equality when it comes to the spiritual warfare because we know God is almighty and, and the enemy is way under his feet. His feet. But we as humans <clears throat> aren't aware of that sometimes, so we give into that stuff and we actually are sinners ourselves and we practice some crazy stuff out there that gets us in trouble, opens doors to that stuff, when in turn we might get influenced by some some weird thought. Take us to that first spiritual attack where okay. you said, hey, this is spiritual, this is real. Well, well the, the first one was, uh, it was with, uh, I, was, I, I asked God to help me about that one anger, rage issue. I started reading this book from Derek Prince. It, it's called Thy Shall Cast Out Demons. He's a deliverance minister. He's a deliverance minister, very equipped, uh, anointed by the Lord. She, um, I read the whole book, and in the back there's a long prayer. Praise God for that prayer. <laughs> because when I'm sitting in my cell, <clears throat> by my cell, on, on the chair, um, I pray the whole prayer, and, and I'm like, it tells you how to renounce curses, how to break curses, how to get rid of the occult involvement in your life. And me being going to that witch, <clears throat> I open a door to a curse too. And besides the curse somebody has put on me. That one time that I was working patrol, that I was working the gang unit, this witch, she worked for 18th Street. She was a witch that worked for 18th Street. She used to do, she had her own little botanic, botanica store in, in the neighborhood. Well, she gave me some cards of the Archangel Michael cards with the prayer, but what I didn't know till later on that she had cursed these cards. So when the cops take them, uh, they, they go into this curse that she put. Yeah. And I, I got cursed by her and a few other officers because I gave them to some officers. What type of curses were on um, these cards that you believe? It's like a death curse. It was a bad curse. It was bad. It's tragedies. Tragedies, yeah. Because yeah, it's it, misfortunes. It, misfortunes, yes. And, and you're not aware of it. How prevalent is that? How prevalent is witchcraft, it's, you know, within gangs? At big time, you have so many gangs, that's what they do. They, most, I believe that most gangs actually practice that stuff because they have the roots in Mexico too. They have the roots in different other parts of the, uh, the states, countries where, where they practice uh, Santeria, white, black magic, 
a different stuff they do, uh, but they're dealing with the, the demonic forces. They're behind the scenes, they're, they're, they're dealing with uh, some spiritual beings that, that don't care about us, don't like us, they want to hurt us. And they're being influenced. They don't realize uh, Santa Muerte, the angel of death. People worship the Santa Muerte. They believe that he it cares about them and really wants to help them. They don't realize that he don't care about you. The one that really cares about you is Jesus, not this 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 uh, demonic force. He don't care about you. He might make you believe that by helping you on certain moments, but when you don't give him what he wants, he's gonna try to hurt you and, and hurt you and your family. And I've seen that firsthand by people that were worshiping this this uh, this uh, demonic force. So we're moving up from knives and bullets yeah, to spiritual warfare, to spiritual witchcraft. Curse, witchcraft. Yeah. Two drugs, too, using drugs, meth, uh, you know, just the dope itself. It's uh, It alters your senses, but at the same time, um, the word uh, for sorcery is pharmakia. The word pharma is a Greek word. It also is inc incantation. They're doing a potion. Some of the warlock is casting a spell on you. He's cooking the dope to cast a spell on you. And, and there is a demonic force behind the scenes, too, right there. And you've seen so, those things manifest. People have, have have ministered to people. I've seen that stuff manifest. Yes, I've seen it when I got a guy mad. Well, he got real mad because I started ministering to him, and the enemy started getting mad inside him, really mad. I said, "Whoa, relax." But it, it was real. <laughs> now, what about like people get these charms, or oh, yeah. they beads and things like that? How can that be spiritually dangerous? It's dangerous. Well, the the witches will put a curse on that too. But if you worship like the, the Santa Muerte, and you did a pact with that Santa Muerte. What is that Santa Muerte? It's the angel of death. And Santa, or we just say Santa Rita. Santeria. Yeah. They practice a different witchcraft. It's the same so thing, basically. It's basically the same thing, and they're using diff different demonic forces, demonic powers to invoke these demons, or what they might think is cool, their friends or buddies. It's not, they're not the friends. They, they'll eventually hurt you. You'll be under this curse eventually, and you'll be suffering. Your life will be cursed. You'll be going through so much eventually when you stop. You'll get tired of it, and it's going to turn around and bite you because that's what they do, try to hurt you. Now, now some of the <clears throat> music. The music, too. That, that's involved, even in, within the cartel. And things yes, that the cartel sort. music, the, the corridos, the corridos, the narco corridos. <clears throat> they talk about the violence, the murder, and, and <clears throat> what they do. They glorify the enemy. They'll, they'll, they'll glorify the practicing sin, too. <clears throat> How can that be spiritually dangerous for someone listening to that? It could influence that person, and it could crack a door where a, a, a demonic entity can take over and influence that person, too. To think that that is awesome to go out there and... Because there's, there's, the there's a spell on the music. There's curse on the music. People will, will make packs to sell their music. They'll make packs and sell their music. And they don't realize that they're opening doors to something bad, to a curse. Um, you have to it's, you take the, the, it's a step, it's a process. You, you'll, you'll first find the, the root, how the door got open, what the person did, how, how he started this. And then once the person wants freedom, he wants deliverance, you plead the, you plead the blood of Jesus to cleanse him. He also asks for, he asks for forgiveness and repents of what he did. He renounces it, um, severs the ties of whatever the practice it is. And then from there, you, you always plead the blood of Jesus to cleanse him. You plead the blood to cleanse the behavior, to remove any, any um, strongholds. And also you ask the Lord to heal any damages that were caused to do that practice. In the name of Jesus. If you go to an area where there's nothing but drive-bys and shootings and shootings, there's a spirit of violence and murder there too. And it's an influential, and there's a spirit of revenge. You just shot one of my homeboys. I gotta go retaliate and get revenge. And that opens up because that's a evil force behind the scenes who's influencing the youngsters to destroy themselves. Uh, if the enemy's here to still kill and destroy, him. If, if he can't get a gun to shoot you, he's gonna get you to shoot somebody else and, and influence you to shoot each other. What about There's one there too. And I believe because of the, the corruption, because of the misconduct, because of the abuse of power, because of the, the fact that you feel about the law or you feel that because you're serving, you're helping others, that you might be self-righteous or you might not need help. And also the deception behind it where you hide, you mask your problem, you put everything 
un under the rug as if it's not there. Or you throw it in the closet, dirty laundry in the closet, like nobody's gonna see it. And you're acting like your life is, is in order. But most officers uh, struggle with different problems. They struggle with PTSD, with alcohol abuse, maybe pill poppers, uh, gambling. Everybody has issues, and they're serving, but nobody's helping them. Nobody's serving them, and they're not. They're not. They don't know if there's a way to uh, get help. They don't have no no mechanism, no coping mechanism. And this is why you want to go yeah. and uh, go on to that mission field. Yeah, because they need it. They need the Lord. Because because had I not had I known the Lord back then, I, I wouldn't have paid the price. I wouldn't learn the hard way. I learned the hard way. I was hard headed. I was prideful. I was, a, I was one of those guys that tried to pretend I was tough, and I didn't want nobody to see my feelings, my emotions. I hit everything, but it, it bites you in the butt because eventually you're gonna, you're gonna blow up. It's gonna come out, and and you 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 think that by sharing your feelings, your emotions, you're weak. You're a human being. You're a person. God made you that way. And you have to find an outlet, the right outlet to help make you healthy, health, help you be healthy, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs>my spirit I mean bottom line is something super nasty happened inside me when I gave my life to the Lord bottom line <clears throat> that's me that's the truth well from that point on uh, God starts molding me but at the same time I'm so struggling <clears throat> when I pray this prayer <clears throat> I felt something evil nasty come out of me I, I felt something pull me and come out of me that it really freaked me out because you know where did it come out of? I felt it come out of my whole my whole body, like from 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 out of my chest, like a pressure, like a pressure, but it, it pulled away from me, heavy something. But then when it left, I felt this lightness. I felt this 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 weight came off of me. And I was like, whoa! Like something had me, like a, like a shadow had me, something had, had me suppressed. I had no clue that that's what it was. But praying the prayers and, and understanding that what I've been told about the curses. It allowed me to understand that that's what it was. It was breaking that first curse because that demon left me. And you're praying this without a minister. So this is just on your just faith. Just on my own faith. Just saying this prayer. Trusting the word of God and praying in the name of Jesus. Of course, the authority comes from Jesus. And, and, the, and the, the victory comes from Jesus. So me understanding that now, because I had been reading that the books back then, <clears throat> I knew that all that was real. So I started exercising my faith in, in the truth. And when I did that, Something did leave my body, it was terrible, but it was awesome at the same time. My family, um, we're raised Catholic, but at the same time, um, because we don't read the Bible, growing up we sometimes just believe what they tell us, we don't realize that we sometimes get into the religion slash occult stuff. Like my grandmother was raised Catholic, but she also went to witches for, somebody had cursed her. <clears throat> So she'd go to witch to get a cleaning, a limpia. And that alone would open up a door for a curse in her life. And that alone could bring a, a generational curse into the bloodline by her own practice. Because it says, the Bible teaches about the generational curses. Well, my grandfather, her husband would practice witchcraft too. And one of my aunts practiced it, my, my grandmother's daughter. So, so there was a curse in the, in the family. Because from my grandmother's side, all her brothers, because I started asking God about this. When I gave my life to the Lord, I started asking God, why does my... I had, so I had to go to a lot of funerals, you know, funerals going up. A lot of them were my uncles, cousins, and... and young tragic, ones. And so young ones. Young, young, young. And even even like, oh, let's just say 20 years old, 30 years old, my own, my own uncles, cousins, tragic death. So I had... When I started reading the Bible, I started questioning God about that. I said, Lord, why is it that that these family members of mine, what, why did they die so young? Why did they die so in such a tragic... Death. The Bible doesn't share. Are uh, you sure? The Bible teaches that you preserve us, you take care of us, you bless our health, you bless us in different areas of our life. You do. That's what the Bible teaches. But my uncle, my, my grandmother, I seen them die tragically, t terrible. One of my uncles was fixing his his lowrider when I was uh, like like seven, six years old. He was fixing it, and uh, the jack broke and crushed his head and killed him. Mm. One of his other brothers, a year, a few years now, one of his other brothers, maybe like four. Five years later, he shot himself in the heart. Just mm -hmm. killed himself. His dad was on the waiting for the bus one day. He just had like a seizure, fell out, hit his head on the sidewalk, and then he went to coma. He died. So well, one day I'm 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 laying in my bunk and uh, I feel something choking me and smothering my face. I don't see nobody physically there, 
But it feels like it a feel human, like, heavy duty. like a some, how, how big did the creature feel that was... If it felt like maybe I'm gonna just say like a 50 pound something pillow on me. Somebody was put like, I felt like the pillow was on my face, smothered my face and my neck choked and strangled my neck. And I know how to rest, I know how to mm. fight, but I couldn't- You couldn't grab the hands. No, I couldn't grab nothing. I had to start to so play. the hands were invisible. Right, I couldn't see nothing, but I could feel the pressure on me, and I I was not dope. I don't use drugs. I started smoking that weed years ago <laughs> before I went to prison. Um, <clears throat> but I started calling, uh, telling him to stop in the name of Jesus. The minute I started exercising in the name of Jesus, it left, and and eventually it came back, but it would leave again, and then it, it just start coming, stop coming back. Well, when did you find it would come back <clears throat> at nighttime or just during the day? Sometimes it came at night when I was laying there and sleeping. But sometimes also during the day, it was just one of those things. It's like they try to torment you and harass you because you're fig you're figuring them out. Well, you have voices sometimes that have to do with, like, say, well, if you're going through something difficult during that time, they'll amplify the thought, the voices that that are going to torment you more. Like, say, in my case, I was going through my whole case, and I started hearing a lot of rumors about my case and about how much time they want to give me and, and different things that my kids are coming out. It's like I started getting more tormented by those voices. Like, oh, what were the voices saying? That I'm not going to get out. I'm going to get life. Um, and I'm being freaked out. Now, what did the voices sound like? Did they sound like you? Did they? Some people say they sound like me, or did they sound Sometimes like... Sometimes they sound like you most, but no, you can feel the pressures because... It's, it's in, right it's inside. It's in your head, it's inside you, but you feel the pressures of knowing it's not you. You know it's not you. Right. You know that ain't you ain't thinking like that because you could shake off a thought sometimes that's yours. Like, I ain't nothing. But some, that stuff was just like constant drilling Did they respond back to you or they just speak? Or sometimes, like, if you would say something, they would respond back? Some Sometimes I would just, uh, what happened is sometimes I would say uh, verses of the Bible and I would feel them getting mad. Like, like, like basically, stop saying that. And they'll get, like, like I'll say, <clears throat> Jesus overcame by, I overcame by the blood of them, the word of my testimony. And uh, I'll start seeing verses that have to do with the, <clears throat> the enemy's uh, final judgment gonna be and, and he uh cast him into like a fire i forget the verse of revelation but i would quote it back then <clears throat> and they didn't like that it would affect them bad because i'm reminding them of their final so what they do how when you say they didn't like it how did you know they didn't I could like feel it them, i could feel them like stop them, stop bugging me basically would they yell and scream or uh, cuss more more like 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 really like tormented if i felt i felt, I felt them being tormented so I turn it around. Spiritual warfare. The Bible is is the word of God. But I know that uh, you might have a psychologist. Psychiatrists talk a lot of a lot of different men, mental games, mental wisdom in their mind, but they haven't touched into the spiritual realm to understand that there's more behind the scenes. Never so, In 2004. Okay, I, I read these books. I'm thinking I'm, I already know what's going on. I already got it all going on. I'm thinking I'm, I'm just this equipped Christian. I'm, that's what I'm thinking because I know I, I experienced supernatural miracles. I experienced supernatural deliverance. Okay, well, give us an example of a supernatural miracle. Uh, just praying for somebody. We're in prison and, I, and me and some other persons, uh, Christian brothers, we pray for somebody and, and the Lord healed them. Mm. Of, a, of, a, of a cancer and that was true wow we pray for this prison then the other thing is we start praying in tongues and, and, and the holy spirit started using us to pray in tongues. and then supernaturally we felt the power of god come upon us and you cannot you cannot confuse That's god's right. presence man there's no way god's presence is so powerful peaceful it just overwhelms you that, that you it's like the best high in the world the best. I mean, I'm sorry to say right. that one, but that's, yeah, that's the best right. experience you could ever have to be in his presence. <clears throat> and when he's there and when you're praying in tongues and the Holy Spirit just comes upon you, I mean, sometimes he just breaks you down. You just start tearing up. It's a supernatural event. And you know you're not alone. You know God is there for you. You know he's real and you know he really loves you. So it gets to the point where, though, these, these attacks are still happening. Like I said, you're going through this process. You, yes, you, and you have some ministers come in. I, I have been reading books on deliverance and, and, and deep level traumatic healing stuff because because I still had no clue of PTSD. I didn't even know that word yet. And this in 2003, 2003 plus, I get moved to the county jail hole. I'm in a hole in San Bernardino County Jail because now I have a second indictment <clears throat> because all the code defense of mine opened up for my other stuff that I was doing. So now I got two indictments and I'm, I'm waiting to get sentenced on that one. <clears throat> And I'm in the hole, 
and uh, how many years have passed since this time? Uh, three, three years, two years, two years, <clears throat> two years passed. But I'm already thinking I'm, I'm squared away. I'm solid Christian. But when I'm in the hole now, <clears throat> I start reading more books on deliverance and, and, and deep inner healing stuff. And uh, I start experiencing some heavy duty uh, demonic manifestations. And I'm like, what's going on? I thought they were gone. I'm thinking that first prayers cleaned me up and I was ready to go. Take us through that. You know, give, give, give us some details. Well, there's times when I'm praying and I'll start feeling them come over me again. And I'm like, what's going on right here? Wait, come over them. Come over me, like put the pressure, that I can feel the presence. Like a, uh, like a weight. Evil, heavy presence, yeah, weight over me. So then I start hitting, feeling some pricks on my side. Boom, boom. Like Whoa. somebody's poking me. Somebody's poking my ribs. And I'm in my bunk and somebody's suffocating me again. And I'm like, what the heck? And I start praying. Get off me in the name of Jesus. Leave me alone in the name of Jesus. And they'll leave and come back. But now I'm feeling a torment inside and I'm from without me. And this is when, like, it's like all hell broke loose inside How often me. is this happening? How often is this well, happening? I, I went through a process, like, maybe, like, two weeks of nonstop, constant torment, beat down that it really... Just throughout the day. Throughout the day. Throughout the day. And it was, like, torment. So I would, what I would just do is get the Bible and start quoting scripture on, on warfare Could scripture. Could you sleep at night? Or was it it was hardcore. Right? Through the throughout the night, I had struggled. It was hardcore. It was like... It's like, go, come and go. Like, come and go, come and go. And that's when I started... I didn't know... This is 2000, now I'm in 2004. PTSD, I don't know the word yet, but that's when I started feeling... I start, oh, I started taking a course on a, it's called the transformation of the inner man by Elijah House and this whole course of deep the video tapes I'm listening to them and as I'm listening to them uh, they have prayers so when I'm taking doing these prayers for deliverance I guess that's when things just started getting uh, released inside me because I started that's when I started feeling the, the strong demonic presence that started freaking out so bad because I couldn't stop it no matter how much verses I quote them are you getting frustrated at this point real frustrated desperate and I'm thinking Lord please help me I don't know what I'm what to do and that's why I still I really felt God saying reach out reach out to the body of Christ there's, my, there's a quick brothers and sisters out to reach out so I started calling my sister and say hey uh, I had books I said reach out to these pastors under the uh, under this ministry she'll reach out to them uh, they're not available they're too far away I finally get I get a I get moved from this place and I go back to San Bernardino County Jail I'm stuck there, and finally some deliverance ministers show up from uh, they call the deep level ministry. Deep, uh, what are they called? Deep healing ministries. That's what they called. Charles, Charles Kraft, who wrote a lot of books from from uh, defeating dark angels. Um, he got a bunch of good books on a uh, authority on the believers' authority. This pastor's a. Uh, other pastors come and see me. They work for him. They, they work in the same ministry together. Kathleen Araya, who's also now their ministry is called uh, Restoring Their Soul, and Pastor Luke, they show up to, to, to jail to visit me. While they're there, they have three or four prayer warriors in the parking lot praying for them while they're doing deliverance for me. And the awesome thing is when I started sharing stuff, they, they already knew what was going on. They, mm. And the Holy Spirit already revealed to them. The Holy Spirit told them to come and see me. They had never been to prison. They told me, they said we gotta now this is happening at the prison or at the jail oh at the jail at the county jail right so they go we've never been to any jail prisons but when i got your note i really clearly felt the lord said to come see you come pray for you because you went through some demonic harassment and i said Whew, thank you jesus so what to tell us the first session how that first, well, the first session, different session there, go? we got into conversations about what was going on and and then they did this this first prayer and i really felt lighter I felt better I felt I felt good so I'm thinking man thank God I hope this is it I'm telling God I think I'm, I'm hope I'm done with this harassment uh they leave I go back to the cell I'm in my cell I'm in a single cell I've been there I've been in a single cell I ended up doing five years in a single cell in the whole uh around nothing but lifers and you know, man Mexican mafia every brother so I'm in this cell so when I'm there um I start sensing a little bit more of that stuff going on, but now it's not as strong, but it's still going on. I'm thinking, when's this gonna stop? And I'm praying, God, said, Lord, why is this taking? Why is this taking so long? Why am I having to go through all this harassment? I thought it was gonna be over with with these prayer sessions. Little did I know, 
that because of so much of my doors that I opened through my PTSD, through my shootings, through my abuse, my violence, my hatred, my un- unforgiveness, I opened so many doors. So there's all these layers. And, and sexual morality, because I was, I was with, being promiscuous with a lot of women. All these doors, man, there were layers and layers that the Lord had to peel. And he wanted to do one at a time. He wasn't going to do just one at, at one time and just mess me all up. So he, he was working on me. But at the same time, what it was doing, it was building my relationship and my trust with God stronger. It was also... I was so judgmental before. I was such a self-righteous individual before. I, I hated everybody. And, and all of a sudden, I'm looking at people that once upon a time I wanted to beat up and, and shoot. I'm loving them. I'm seeing them different, man. And God is working in me. Mm. And I'm saying, man, I can't be like that with this person. And, and if I had some issue come up, I'd say, Lord, why do I feel that towards this person? Yeah. But the, the beautiful part about this is because the Lord was, was dealing with my rooted issues to the, the deep level healing, that the Lord were, they were having to release legal rights. So they were leaving. They were just leaving one at a time, and it was awesome because I could feel A lot of times, it's like if, like me, I was a cop. If we have these, these the rule books, and we know that if we watch, uh, if we see something going on out there, in that rule book saying, "Well, that is a violation of the of the law," that guy can get a ticket or he can get arrested if he's selling drugs. Well, that's, in our rule books, that's illegal to sell drugs. Or, or if you got a gun on him and it's doing something with that gun, it's, it's a, that's. It gives me a legal right to go and arrest that guy, harass him. I mean, stop him, arrest him, process him, uh, process him and book him. That's what it gives me the right. Same thing with the spiritual realm. The, the enemy of the spiritual realm, there's, there's legal rights, legalistic stuff. That means that if, if I'm practicing sin and I'm violating God's laws, it's giving the enemy rights to basically harass me or go and mess with my life. So how do you break the legal rights? Is it through repenting? And you're talking about renouncing. Right? Renouncing. You're saying you had to renounce. Like say, I, let, and let that's just, break covenant. Yeah, but you renounce it. You ask for forgiveness. You ask for forgiveness because we sin against God. We ask for forgiveness. We do renounce it. They just say it was uh, lust. Being, being a fornicator. I'm going to have to ask for forgiveness of that. I'm going to renounce it. And I'm going to repent of it. I'm going to turn away from it. I'm going to stop Going back to that, to that practicing sin, I'm gonna turn away from it. Same thing if I'm, um, if I'm using drugs, and I know that that's not only, it's an addiction, it's a destructive thing that's gonna hurt you and destroy your life and, and, and not let you fulfill God's purpose in your life. Same thing, if you want, you, you crack the door open somehow. It could have been through some, some childhood event. It could have been just to fit in, you start smoking the weed and you start going into deeper stuff. You open that door somewhere or another. Now, how many years had, you know, had gone by when these deliverance ministers come in, and for and three how, years, and how long did that process oh, take for you to get delivered? It's been it been going. It's it's, it's been a process. <clears throat> it's okay. taking the process. Like say, it didn't. It, it took some years because how about post traumatic stress? That too. When did that? Do you remember when that came out? That also was a process because I had to bring my events to God and then forgive the persons, forgive myself if I was holding anything against myself ask for forgiveness mm, and then repent of it. why is that important you can forgive you can yourself for, you can forgive everybody that, that hurts you you can forgive anybody that even if they abuse you beat you whatever the case may be <clears throat> but if you haven't forgiven yourself you're still going to be bound up that's still going to give the enemy legal rights to hold on to you and you're going to be harassed and it could also keep the stronghold inside you and you have forgiving yourself it is one of it's also an important thing thing because uh you're basically going against uh, God's program, process. And Psalms 103 says he removes our sins as far as the east. If he forgives you from the west, that's he right. He forgives you for you, not to forgive yourself. Right. He forgives you for... Um, I'm in one of the yards in Texas, and I show up, and I had already been down maybe like 12 years already. So I had already been to different yards, and the Lord had already used me to, to minister to people in different yards. Now are you doing deliverance? I'm doing deliverance and I'm doing a deep level tra- traumatic healing, a PTSD healing, 
Uh, the Lord is working in those areas of, and putting the people in my path that He wants me to help. I'm doing deliverance. I'm doing uh, inner healing because a lot of at prison, man, so many hurt, hurt and wounded people there that I started asking God to use me. I'm here, Lord, use me. I was around lifers too in the holes. I would preach to lifers. I pray and pray deliverance for lifers. With I've delivered guys that were under a curse. They were from the cartel and, and they got cursed by, by a girlfriend. And I seen him get delivered. I seen the demons manifest inside him and he didn't believe in that stuff either. How would they manifest? Uh, they start having like seizures, contorting, the body's moving like that. Like, you know, it's not no, nothing normal, it's something uh, supernatural and it's not good. And the person's freaking out and doing some weird moves in his body. And, and then uh, from that, his eyes are trying to pull, roll back and, and you, know, you see all kinds of stuff. And then from there, uh, when you're praying in the name of Jesus and, and the person, you're renouncing the curse and you see the, you see the person's body just go limp and drop, and he's telling you, oh, I never believed in that stuff. I'm delivered. I feel it. Oh, my God. And, and mm. that person who was a cartel killer, crazy dude, and now he got the Bible under his armpit. No one let it go because he knows there's two forces at war, but he knows the strongest, the real force, the powerful force is Jesus. So a whole personality change. Personality change. And sometimes it's the spirit animating that, that person's right. personality. Yeah. And that, that curse was gone. They can't stand. The, they can't stand Jesus. They can't. They can't uh, go against Him. Mm. And the only way they could hurt the Lord sometimes when try to hurt humans because they can't hurt Him. They can't touch Him. Now what? Now I'm I'm in, I'm in the new prison in, in Fort Worth, Texas. When I show up, there's 1,900 people in that prison. Mm. There's it, it's, it's it's there's a lot of different politics, uh, prison politics, gang politics. When I show up, um, I go to the shot callers, the Mexican shot callers, and, and I tell them who I am, my name, and what I'm there for. Because right away, when you go to prison, the races are going to hit you up. They're going to think they think I'm white, so they're going to hit the white boys are going to hit me up, and they're going to ask me where I'm from, who I'm running with. And right away, I say I, I'm a Christian, I run with the Lord, but I'm also Mexican. So I go to the Mexican shot caller and tell them that I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. But I am Mexican. I don't run the politics stuff, but I, I do serve the Lord, and I am in prison for this reason. I tell them why I'm in prison. So that's pretty bold. Because I believe this. I said, I said, look, Lord, if I'm gonna represent you in here, I'm in here. I got this. is What I have to do my time. This how I gotta do my promise. The way you want me to do. I can't be doing it while hiding and acting like I, you know, like nothing happened. I, I messed up, and I want to serve you in here. But if I go in there and start pretending that. Uh, I'm in here for text me. They find out and I'm trying to serve God. They're going to say I'm a coward. I'm well, how, how, how do you develop that uh, confidence. that faith that, you know, to go to them, that confidence, I wasn't, well, that courage to, to I mean, because that could be like a death warrant. Well, I, I figure like this. The worst they could do to me is they could try to jump and beat me up or send me to the hole. I said, I, I ain't worried about it. I, I, I'm, I'm a fast runner. If you want to jump me <laughs> five or ten, I'm running. I'm running. I'm checking. Wow. They're gonna put me in the hole. Who cares? I'll do my time in the hole. I ain't worried about it. I don't want to have to defend myself, fight nobody. But I mean, I could, but I didn't want to do that. To Lord, I ain't trying to fight them more. Lord, I'm tired of fighting. Tired of the violence. I, I want the on the blood. I, I've I've already seen so much murder, violence. I've, I've been to too much of that. So I said, I want to save souls now. So I'm gonna let them know that I, I serve you, and, and I know you're gonna. The Bible says. When the your ways please, please the Lord, even your enemies, That's right. He puts your enemies at peace with you. And I, I believe him for that because it was true. Because when every yard I went to, the Sureños are the gang members that would probably hate me the most because I was a gang cop for for Southern California in the gang unit, and I messed with the, I, I dealt, dealt with the 18 Streeters, MS, the biggest gangs out there. But uh, the Lord gave me favor with them because I would even uh, play soft on their team. But uh, the truth was, He gave me peace for my enemies, and and, and He would. And they would see that Christ was in me. They would see it. I'm gonna tell them straight up, look, I'm a Christian, I serve the Lord. And I know what I did in the past. I know why I'm in here. I'm telling you guys straight up, because I'm not a liar and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here because I'm not scared. I'm not trying to be all tough for nothing, because I'm not, but I'm not afraid because I serve the Lord. I know he's gonna help me out, but I'm here to preach the gospel. I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to be gang banging. I'm here to, to bring Christ to you guys. And, and uh, I just wanna do my time. And the people left me alone. And of course, you're gonna have people behind your back hating on you, talking crazy. I told her, look, you deal with those guys. And and if anything would happen to me where I started feeling like a little bit of ill feeling to somebody because I felt they're talking behind my back, and the, the enemy wanted me to go and smack that guy, I said, Lord, I'll forgive that guy and help me not hate him. Help, help me not hold nothing against the guy. He don't know any better. And and I just move on, be about my, my, my business. So the Lord, I worked for the chaplain there. 
started bringing me some of the, the guys that had PTSD. He brought a ex former police officer, lieutenants, military. He brought me John molesters. He brought me gang members, people that really wanted to serve, change and get help. He bring them to me. And I'll tell the Lord, you brought them to me, Lord. I'm not going to deny them, but I'm going to see them the way you want me to see them. And I'm, I'm here for them. And the chapter will bring me people. So word started getting out. Yeah, word will get out. That, hey, we have someone that's anointing to pray for people with right. post traumatic stress yeah. and different stuff. Various other things. And deliverance. And then I'm getting people. So you're sharing your testimony. I'm, I'm sharing a lot. my testimony a lot. So then I'm dealing with different people that, that have different backgrounds. I'm talking from the cartel guys, from the gangs, from the dope, from you name it, military guys, cops. And now I'm dealing with these guys. And they're respecting me. And why? Because they know that the door is working to me. So there's people still out in prison right now that you have decided that decided are winning what? souls right and now. setting the captives free. Big time. Right and now, as a matter of fact, one of my Christian brothers in there who got 14 years, who's a former lieutenant for the SWAT team in, in San Francisco up there, uh, who was a he just, uh, I just found out that he has, he's doing Bible studies there now. And that the Lord is using him to minister, deliver, and, and deep level healing because of the Lord using me to equip him. And he got a theology master's now. Praise God. And he was atheist before. <laughs> and he was going to kill his house before. He was suicidal. Wow. Now, how'd you come about? The you chaplain know, brought him hey, to me. Wow. The chaplain in him, four tickets, brought him to me and said, hey, I want you to talk to this guy. He's going to psychology for two years. Nightmares, flashbacks, a PTSD. What turned it around? What, I mean, was it something the Holy you said? Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. But I mean, was the first session? Or was it the first second? First, first session, session. We had three sessions, and each session, the Lord, the Lord will move and, and cause a results. We'll, we'll move, and, and the Lord and heal, heal, heal him. Yeah, praise God. And this person is doing great. He's doing Bible study. They moved him to another prison in Lompoc, and he. I just found out to his wife that he's actually. She wrote and said he's actually doing a, a Bible studies now. The chaplain approved the classes on the topic of deliverance and inner healing. He's in it, praise God. The children's bread, the Bible talks about it. it, it, it the Bible talks about uh, there's there's different kinds of healings in the Bible. You, and there's type, different types of, every person has different types of issues. The Lord that created us knows what's wrong with each one of us. If some people crack the door, open doors to deliverance and have to demonization, if you don't get that and you want to serve the Lord right, you're going to be harassed and tormented. You're going to be stuck. You're not going to be able to get through the rut. You need deliverance. You really need it. That's uh, that's one of the things that when you came to Christ, you had already do, been serving the enemy for so many years. Even if you knew or didn't know, you were already opening the doors to that devil. And you were serving him. Is that why people make time backslide? Uh, I, down back, belief? I, I believe so. I believe one of the things. They've never got delivered. They got saved, but they never got, they never delivered. got delivered. But a lot of people want to confuse the scripture and say that all things have passed. All things all things have become new. All things have passed away. Your, 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 your record is under the blood. Your record, you're clean. You're forgiven. You're redeemed. But the one thing you don't understand, your spirit is new. Your spirit is one with Christ now. You're one, one with the Holy Spirit. What you don't know is that your soul and your fleshy mind still has a, attachments, harassments, open doors. And the enemy, the Bible says the Word of God has to renew your mind and also transform you. But at the same time, you need the deliverance because that's where the enemy could be attached to. It says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not give room to the, the devil, the enemy. But if you have been a... a practicing angry individual who's opened doors to the enemy for so many years you come to Christ you know that behind the scenes that spirit's right there harassing you and you could be a loving Christian something but that anger could just can't control you and you don't know that's a demonic force right there so in closing what is on the horizon for Ruben right now what is it on the horizon for you what is God What's your next mission? I mean, you're already on a mission now, but like I said, you're out here now after doing 16 years. 16 years, yes. And that's a long time. But now, God has a new chapter in your life. Right. Um, what does that consist of? I, I, I see the Lord opening doors for me to go out back and, and, and preach to police officers too because they, they need the Lord. If you have good leaders, they will help the communities heal. 
and then people respect him. People will see Christ in these leaders and they'll respect the police officers, but also uh, reach out to the gang members, reach out to our communities out there and, and, and do a outreach programs to help people and educate people and share, share the Lord. A lot of viewers out there that have been saved, right? But there's having, you know, these tormenting thoughts, they're having, like, see, these night terrors. Uh, maybe some of them are getting physically, because, like I said, these spirits can physically attack. They could. A lot of these individuals have generational curses and things like that. Right. What would your advice be to them? Where right. do they start to get that process of getting delivered? My advice would be uh, don't lose your hope, don't get discouraged. The Bible is true. It does talk about them. It is. It is real. Uh, there is answer. There's solution. Uh, you have to. You have to seek the body of Christ. There's a lot of members of the body of Christ that are so equipped and blessed by God that care about you, that love you, and want to help you. But don't be afraid. Don't think you're the only one that's going through it. You're not alone. There's the hope. There's so many members that are the body of Christ that have been through it, been there, done that, and, and can help you. Don't think you're the only one. Don't think you're alone. Don't think I don't love you. Don't think I'm not there for you. Then you must believe that lie. There's so many people there for you to help you, and you got to reach out. Reach out. There's, every, you have a, a vast number of brothers and sisters that want to help you. They care about you. Father, Don't we just you. thank you so much. There's no name above your name. I wouldn't serve any other name. Yeah, sure, Mashiach. There's power in the name. Yes, Yeshua. Yeshua. We bless, we bless your name. We bless your name.